Hi there. Thanks very much to Sarah and everyone for inviting me to be part of today. I'm a, I have a background in law and criminology, and um, I'm usually, I usually describe myself as a visual criminologist. And I guess what's important to start by saying is that in criminology, working with the visual is very much um, a fringe activity, and there's not a great deal of critical reflection upon um, the nature of the image and the nature of visual research. So it's quite a treat for me to be here today. So I want to start with a series, with two scenes. The whole paper is structured around five scenes, but I'll start with two um, initially. So scene one, a man is following a woman through the streets of a city. He takes photographs of her, he writes notes about her, and he does all of this without her knowledge. So this forms part of an artwork by the French artist Sophie Cal. Sophie Cal asked her mother to hire a private detective to follow her without her knowledge. The detective's field notes and photographs become part of the artwork that Sophie Cal makes from this experience. She said afterwards that she wanted the detective to give her a sense of her existence within the city and within everyday life, that he would document her and that she would understand herself by means of his documentation. In scene two, a woman approached me in a gallery a couple of weeks ago and asked if I would like the gift of a song. So this happened in the Museum of Contemporary Art in Sydney. And it's part of an artwork by Li Ming Wei called Sonic Blossom. So in this artwork, um, a trained classical singer selects a visitor randomly, or I really don't know why I was picked, but I was. So she came up and said, would I like a gift of a song? And I went, oh well, yes. And she took me into a room, sat me in a chair, stood about 20 feet away from me, and then sang one of Schubert's Lieder to me. Now, both of these artworks have a visual trace. Sophie Cowell's experience um, is photographed by the detective, and, and the artwork that she exhibits consists of his field notes and the photographs of her, which are exhibited in the, in the, in the gallery afterwards. And you can, you can see photographs of Lee Ming Wei's work. You can um, watch a, a, an excerpt from it on the MCA's website. But neither of these artworks really exist as visual artworks at all. They're, um, they're, uh, they're fleeting, they're evanescent, and they're also a series of encounters and moments. And rather than images, they're about um, feelings or ideas or senses or perhaps even relations. So I'm interested in works, mo um, experiences that are composed of fleeting, accumulating moments and encounters. And I'm interested in the challenge of how we fix, as researchers, how do we fix the evanescent? How do we record the temporary? And um, what does this mean for doing research on everyday life? And I think uh, many of the papers today have been showing how various technologies may um, bring us closer to answering these questions. So these two artworks that I'm starting with also put on display the places that currently occupy my research efforts, the street and the museum. So both are public spaces, and yet their public qualities are somewhat diminished by the fact that they're almost certainly privately owned and privately controlled. Both of them contain members of the public. And yet, the surveillant eye, whether it's mine as a researcher or whether it's those of the authorities, will be drawn to some of these public individuals and not others. So both street and museum are also accessible to the researcher, and yet there are constraints upon my relation to the space and its occupants that arise from their very accessibility and their public nature. Now, for these two scenes, these two scenes of the street and the museum, I've deliberately not shown any visual representation of them. But in what follows in the remaining three scenes, I'm going to um, speak about and show some of the digital visual techniques that I've been um, involved in in trying to research in the street and in the museum. So I'm going to reconfigure these two sites 
in the scenes that follow. There are going to be two scenes in the street. The first one um, is about a scene of continual flux, um, and I'll be telling a story of change over time in one space. And I'm going to return to the street for the fifth and final scene, in which the street becomes a scene of display and judgment simultaneously. These scenes um, contain material that's been animating my work, which is um, on street art and graffiti over about 20 years now. And in the fourth scene, um, we'll be visiting the museum, where um, my colleague Lachlan McDowell and I, um, Lachlan from the VCA, where we're interested in the space of the museum as a site of governance, spectatorship, and circulation. So first of all, let's start with a wall. So this is a wall in a street in Fitzroy. Could be any wall in a street in Fitzroy, except that my attention was drawn to it when a very small street sculpture was glued to an, an odd bit of, of um, a, what we could really call a stone protuberance. Really, I'm not quite sure what this is, but it is there. It's um, stone. It's attached to the wall. Um, here you can see it's painted like the wall, a beautiful ochre color. So the street sculpture is by an artist called Will Coles. And um, that's what drew my attention. That was in 2012. And since then, I've been documenting this space. Although as you'll see, um, my focus, my focal point um, changes from this sculpture and the wall itself becomes the object of my interest. Um, the side wall, and this is a rear wall of a florist, um, become, after this point, they become contested. So a great deal of tagging starts to take place on the wall. Um, the council starts to clean it. And then the owner of the wall, the, the owner of the florist's business, take on the business of governance. So um, the wall, you'll see the wall being painted um, a very dull gray. Um, and then the installation of cameras and so on, and various other control devices. So you're going to see a sequence of fluctuation, and I'll pause it just at a couple of points during it um, to talk about what's, what's happening. Okay, so at this point you can see the wall is partly gray and still and partly ochre. So here we have tags on the door, um, but no tags on the wall, um, and no tags down the side. Then cameras appear up on the wall, and the grey has been extended. A very notorious graffiti writer in Melbourne called Nost has written a very large version of his tag and has also drawn a camera. So Nost is aware of the surveillance cameras and has put a camera at the side to, to point this out. This gets partially buffed, and then this is added. So it says here, this is not a graffiti writer's tag name. This indicates that if you stand here, you are in the blind spot of the cameras. <laughs> so this gets added to when Nost adds, Nost was here. <laughs> and so then we return to gray, and then there will follow a kind of dance um, as the, the graffiti writers and the owner of the business negotiate the space. So at this point you can see someone's helpfully drawn an arrow <laughs> pointing out the camera. A series of mutations returns to what I think of as resetting the space. <laughs> okay, so that's what the wall looks like at the moment. This is um, haphazardly a, um, accumulated archive. 
I, I've seen someone give a presentation on um, a wall that they were monitoring where they went to the wall every week on the same day at the same time, a little bit like Harvey Keitel's character in the film Smoke. Um, they went to the wall, they stood in the same place, they framed it in the same way, and they accumulated the material into a time-lapse sort of um, short film that, that was quite powerful and very remarkable. It was like watching history. It was like watching a na nature documentary where flowers bloom and die in a matter of seconds. So I haven't done that. And I didn't do that because I wanted to do justice to the randomness of being in the street and seeing things change. I lived near this wall and I paid it little attention until Will Cole's sculpture appeared. And what I'm documenting as much as the wall is the nature of my being in the space around it. So I wanted to stand in slightly different places. Um, the framing of it changes um, because I got Instagram, and so sometimes it's a square framed image and sometimes it's portrait, and it wasn't deliberate, it's simply that I was in a hurry and didn't change the setting on the camera back to portrait, and sometimes I wanted it square because I wanted to Instagram the image and so on. And um, people were talking about that kind of framing earlier, so it may be, I'll just say as an aside, that some um, street artists now talk about designing images based on what will look good on Instagram in a square format rather than <coughs> landscape, which would be the normal way you'd photograph a wall. So does it matter? So I think that here there are effects that I'm trying to generate through this kind of randomness and haphazardness. I want to try and indicate that um, there's a call and response between me, me and the wall, and there's also a call and response based on my being in the street. I'm, I'm trying not to approach it as a researcher, but as a member of the public as well, and to, um, to use the archive to activate the history of my being in the space. So I want to move now to a different scene. As I said, scene four is in the museum. So Lachlan McDowell from the VCA and I are conducting a study of publics and museums. So we're, we did a little study of the Ai Weiwei and Warhol show at the NGV earlier this year. We're interested in how museums think about visitors, about risk, about display, about immersion of the visitor in the space, and yet the need to control what the visitor does. So, Sometimes that's about, really about crowd control. You can see here on the final night of the, of the show, um, the gallery was, ex was extremely crowded and um, it's really about moving large numbers of people from room to room where they're often very valuable um, artworks. And so the gallery was enormously interested in people visually, digitally displaying their experiences. And so people were exhorted to share their experience um, to take selfies, to um, post their images on um, various platforms. But it's also, what's interesting to us is that it's not clear as researchers how much digital, visual information we can record and display of the people who are at the exhibition. So I'll talk a little bit about those different issues. There were two artworks that we were particularly interested in in the exhibition as problems for the museum to manage. Um, this is one, it's called Map of China. It's a large wooden sculpture, and you can see how it's being protected by a, a white line. So the white line is supposed to indicate to people where to stand. Um, this was routinely ignored. <laughs> and because I saw people, um, I saw one person resting on the, on the sculpture like this, Another person put a, a drinks bottle on it as though they were at a bar um, and someone else rested their bag on it and started to sort through it. There was, it was strangely inviting to people. And of course this caused headaches for the museum. And so what you can see here in the edge of the frame is a guard who is attempting to, to move people behind the line to protect the artwork. So the other one that we were interested in was called Peony. It's a very large um, sculpture in porcelain. Um, it's locate, it was located low on the floor. It was a low plinth. There are thousands of peonies that have been that were sculpted specifically for this show. 
It's extremely fragile. Um, on the walls, you can see Andy Warhol's screen-printed flowers around it. So those flowers are, are screen-printed by Warhol from um, an angle immediately above the flowers. And so what, of what that did was encourage viewers of the peony sculpture to want to stand and create the same angle with these peony sculptures. And yet that was exactly what the museum didn't want them to do. And so around the edge, no white line, but around the edge of the plinth, it said, please do not lean over this artwork. The museum was worried that people would drop their cameras or their smartphones onto the sculpture and it would then shatter. So this meant that there was a continual dance within this room whereby people would immediately approach the sculpture and try to do exactly that. They would lean over it and try to photograph it from above. And the guards would be continually circling around the artwork trying to move people back. So here we can see three people who are about to lean over the, the image. And here the guard who's noticed what they're doing um, comes to, to indicate that they must withdraw behind it. So what the guard is trying to produce is this, this is a, if you like, a docile subject, mm -hmm. someone who's photographing from a distance who will get um, an angle rather than an, um, an angle that's not exactly what they want, probably. Um, it looks better if you can lean over it, but, um, it's, but is doing the right thing. And this is the panoptic eye of the guard um, policing this vast sculpture um, in a state of high anxiety. So what Lachlan and I have been trying to do, this, what you've seen really are the, the raw photographs. These are what we documented um, when we were there. And then what we've also tried to think about is what we can do with these images in relation to um, trying to conceptualize what we're thinking about. So we're interested in the panoptic eye of the guard, the surveillance eye, and how the artwork for the guard becomes really a blank space. And for the guard, the, the visitor is the object to be watched, not the artwork. And so here we're trying to bleach out the artwork to show how the, the surveillance eye sees the visitor, even at a distance, as something to be, to be monitored. So we're trying to give a sense of, um, of how the museum sees the space. We're also interested in the idea that it's not clear whether we can use these images of visitors um, straightforwardly. So people are in public when they're in the museum. It is a kind of public space. But on, on the other hand, perhaps they're not there to be researched. So perhaps when they're there viewing artwork, they're not necessarily expecting to be researched by us. And so we created this image of the space in order to show what the space would look like if we didn't show the public within it. And so you have the, the room, the guard, and then a blank space within it. So just to move from there to the final scene, um, where I really wanted to try and bring together some of the themes that, that I'm interested in around ethics and public and publics, the idea of changing spaces and to add in the idea of crime. What happens when we, re when we record a crime or when a crime starts to unfold while we're recording something else? So not far from here is Hosier Lane. Um, everyone's probably, everyone from Melbourne's probably familiar with Hosier Lane. So um, Hosier Lane is filled with the public most days and um, here I'm photographing um, an, an event that's taking place there. Everyone's photographing everyone else. They're in public. There's no sense that perhaps they don't want to be photographed. But is that true? So here we see people posing for photographs. It's a much photographed location, probably one of the most in Melbourne. But do they want to be photographed by me? Do they want to be part of this PowerPoint display? <laughs> My university has got a suspicion that perhaps these people should be giving permission if I'm utilizing the images. I don't want to think that's necessarily the case. And certainly there are a lot of debates about what it means to be in public and then what can be done with the images that are generated. I have friends who are street photographers and one photographs commuters asleep on trains. 
they're completely unaware of being food craft. They're in a private state, something normally associated with intimate space at home, but they're displaying their sleep in public and they've been photographed. What happens if you're in Hosier Lane and you start to, and you see someone who is tagging a wall? So um, I saw this young boy pick up a spray can and start to tag. Does it matter that he's tagging in a space where there's also a fashion shoot taking place. And so everyone is kind of on display. So perhaps he isn't thinking of himself as committing a crime that's being recorded. And then on another day in Hosier Lane again, I see these two different young boys who are tagging the menu of Movida. There's a kind of proliferation of tagging within Hosier Lane and clearly these, these um, Participants in the scene felt that there was a, a lack of restriction on what they might do. But the manager of Movida was not quite so sure. And so <laughs> while I'm photographing what's going on, um, the, the manager comes out and indicates that he's about to call the police. So suddenly what I have are images that are on the borders of documentation, display, and evidence, and I have no clear answers to what any of this means, but I do think it's a, an interesting question about the public and about change, so that I wasn't there to document crime, I was there to just to document what I saw on the walls, but suddenly crime was what I had on the screen. I'm there to document the walls, but I also photograph people routinely as they walk to and fro. Are there limits to any of this? Are there problems? As ethnographers and researchers, are we um, able to deal responsibly with these images? And what, would the, what are our responsibilities to the people within them? I believe that I have a sort of innate sense of what's right to do with them, but perhaps that doesn't coincide with the subjects who don't know that they're in these images, which are then reused. And I think that, that that's an issue that might apply, whether it's the Queen Victoria market, whether it's um, people who are being filmed by drones, whether it's those of us photographing graffiti. But um, I wanted to end with that point of uncertainty and to say that I'm sure as camera technologies expand 360 degrees all around us, that these issues will not go away. Thank you. Thank you, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I think it's, so with a camera, um, with photography, you have to press the button. So deciding to press the button or not um, feels different from like running a video. I haven't used a GoPro, I think it would be interesting to do so, but it, you know, you're out there with it continuously running and so on, and that, that, that perhaps is a different affect for the researcher. But certainly, yes, it, I've, you know, um, I do feel conscious of when you take the picture or not. And so you probably saw with a lot of the museum ones, people's heads are not included because um, we're aware of that question of whether 
we should be I making people identifiable. And so if we're interested in things like the white line on the ground, then we'll try to photograph people's feet or the backs of their heads rather than their, the front of their head. But I do know peop other people who think that that's not, that, that really isn't an issue and that the, the research intention transcends any possible eth you know, ethical questions. Yeah. Well, maybe the intention there in being able to frame it in that way actually makes it more ethical practice, right, than the body camera, which is just going to kind of capture whatever it captures. Or maybe, or maybe the ethics then gets moved to the edit, right, where you crop it out. And yes. I mean, I'm uncertain that there's any problem with the, the, the body camera. I mean, I do think that um, if we're in public in the street, that there are so many cameras, whether it's CCTV with private or state government, whether it's people taking selfies that you inadvertently feature in, I do think that we live our lives on the screen. And part of me actually wants to um, say, well, that is the condition of modernity. And so many of these issues might seem like a red herring to me. Um, on the other hand, it's, you know, there's clearly a boundary where it becomes problematic because um, images can be used in a whole series of ways that I wouldn't want to endorse. But I don't, I don't necessarily have a problem with the, the GoPro because it's, it's, hit, it's smaller, to, harder to see and because it's able to capture everything. I also really think, I've, I've been fascinated by the discussion about the, the GoPro and the um, 360 degree camera. And I do think that what's striking is that even though they are apparently more all-encompassing, they're still not all-encompassing, and that either through distortions of angle and perspective, or there's still always something that's not in there. And it's, it's um, I do think that probably visual technology won't ever do all of it. I, I wonder if I might just jump in there, because I obviously had to think about this. When Edna and I did our experiments with the GoPro, we did go through the university ethics yeah. process to get to get approval. Um, I think that there's a, you, you, you know, this sort of moment of kind of um, ethical tension, I suppose, can come, I think, at lots of different times. It can come when you're taking the image, it can come when you're editing the footage or, or framing or, you, you know, cropping the image. It can come when you're deciding whether or not to use it in a presentation or in a publication. Like, there are all these sort of different moments at which you're kind of engaging different ways of thinking about, you know, making, recording, utilizing, mashing up, cropping, you know. So, so I think it is, you know, there, there, there is this kind of um, long, ongoing process of ethical consideration. Um, I, I did, did, did you find that as well? That sure, sure. Yeah. Every, like with choosing images to show today, yeah. any kind of presentation, absolutely. I think it also goes back to the question of, of responsibility and ethics and where you, where you place the responsibility and how you kind of situate that and how you share it as well, which, um, which wasn't actually what I was going to talk about. But, <laughs> um, but um, I think there's some interesting questions there about and about different ways and styles of doing research and why those different styles of research put the ethics as well, which maybe we'll talk about at the end. But um, what I actually wanted to talk about was those questions about when we do take a particular risk responsibility and decision for ethics which determines how we frame the image and what we put in it and what we don't. And you said you, you took just photos of feet or legs. Um, and it reminds me of the project that um, Larissa and I are working on where we got ethics approval. Um, to look at, to film hands, but not faces. Okay. And I was actually horrified at the beginning. So I can I actually film people if I'm not filming their faces because it, it seemed to me that I needed to. But, but actually what came out of that project was really interesting because we ended up, I would already written one article about the hand in a different context and we ended up writing another article about the hand. Um, and I think it, so that also takes me back to Adrian's talk. Yeah. And about, attention and what we are actually attentive exactly. to when we're filming in particular ways and, and in ethics then becomes part of the whole picture of how intentionality is framed yeah. um, maybe by accident 
in some of those situations. But then if your attention is focused on the feet, then feet actually, and what we do with our feet, I presume, becomes actually a really interesting question about how we, situ how we situate ourselves in the world and how we use our feet to do that. I think, I think that's right, and it was particularly, I guess, useful or, or appropriate because we were interested in the white line in the gallery mm. and how effective or ineffective it is and when it's ignored and so on. So um, spending like two or three hours watching people either notice it or not and then put their bodies mm. on top of it or not was, was fantastic. And having the photographs afterwards um, I think, it's, as Adrian said, if, if we'd had whole body shots all the time of people, your eye is drawn to the face mm -hmm. and so on, and we would not probably have been able to, uh, to learn as much as we did about the movement of people in space as mm -hmm. through just concentrating on the feet. Yeah. yeah. Adrian and then The ethics is complex because even incidental images can be problematic and a, an interesting case study for that is red light cameras. So with red light cameras, which you think is the most simple thing, someone is speeding, or gone for a red light camera or whatever, and got a photograph and it gets closer to them, please pay the fine. Um, eventually um, law enforcement groups stopped doing that because it caused the ethical issue that sometimes someone was in the car going for a red light and sitting next to someone who maybe they shouldn't have been sitting yes. through, and it caused a marriage breakdown, which was probably too big a penalty for having gone for a red light. Yes. And so the police forces, the law enforcement authorities, changed their policies not to send out a photograph, provide the photograph on request. My, my point is, that even though we think we might select things along good grounds, an incidental image, can be very damaging in a certain context to people. And it needs to be very, very carefully thought about the process. It, even, and I was thinking of that example because you said someone selectively pushing a button. But these are totally automated images oh. which are causing huge social problems until they change their policies. Yes, I mean, there's a long history of filmmakers and photographers and writers about the visual who've pointed out that, um, that at the, you know, in, in real life, <laughs> to the extent that it exists, we can easily overlook things, as you pointed out. And there's something about the, the visual trace, the visual record, that focuses the eye quite differently. And so whether it's Antonioni or um, the, the movie The Conversation and so on, about how the technology actually allows you to discern what you overlooked in real life because your brain was doing something else. So I think that the examples you gave are clear instances of that. Um, just incidentally, I guess, and, and relatedly, if, if you look at graffiti in real life, it's often quite hard to read, but if I look at it through the lens of the camera, I can read it. It's same writing, but I, the camera allows me to read it. I, I presume because it cuts out the additional visual information. Yeah. I have a very quick comment, really in praise of your first response to, to Brad's question before. I mean, this way of analyzing and normalizing the act of making pictures, and I just wanted to raise it because, and I include myself in that category, we're all like almost a bit scared of sounding celebratory just because we engage with these technologies. No? So we all kind of say we do it, but we apologize that we're actually doing it. No? <laughs> and it, it, I just got reminded, you know, Friedrich Kittler's own observation on this. He says that we all get a bit scared of the fact that we create tools that go beyond our senses, but that's really why we created them to begin with. Yeah? They are there to go beyond our senses. So the telescope brings us into the, the planets and the microscope into our bodies and so on and so forth. So we should actually be quite celebratory of our own engagement with these two. Then, whether we celebrate them you know, as a revolution, that's a second matter. But the fact that there is actually something quite beautiful in the fact that we all kind of try to engage with these technologies, look at where they go. Just, your comment just made me think about that, and maybe you want to spin a bit further on it. I think that's, um, I think that's a great comment, and um, it's certainly striking that a lot of a lot of the comments that are made around the new visual technologies, people will often at some point say, it's pretty scary. 
So I do notice that uh, affectively we, we want to announce um, a sort of dread or anxiety around them. Mm -hmm. At the same time, there is a remarkable beauty to them as well. Like I do, and the achievement of what they offer is extraordinary. So we, we might want to hold on to the dread and the, the anxiety as well. But to, I do think you, you showed that little clip of um, the drone in Iceland. Um, and what was extraordinary about it, of course, is the, the lack of bumpiness. So whereas like, what's great about the GoPro is you get that, wow, bumpiness, and you're in the moment. Whereas the drone is an unreal moment. It's, such a, it's like motion that we can never achieve. And that's new. And it's kind of exciting. Thank you very much, Alison. We'll stop questions there. Thank you.